Can we add fillers to resins? That is the question of today's video. Now, out in the wild, you rarely see just a resin, a cured resin part. Whenever you see a part that involves resin, it's usually because you're using it in a, you know, two-part composite where you have fibers for strength, and then you're adding resin around that to give it dimensionality and to bond those fibers together. So, we're gonna try to replicate that today with a regular resin printer. We're gonna be using the Elegoo Mars 2 Pro. This is the beat up model um, that, I don't know, got damaged in packaging or shipping. And Elegoo have already sent out a replacement unit for this one. So if we break the screen or anything else on this model, uh, we do have a spare. And because this is a monochromatic LCD, it allows us to put a lot more energy and a lot more light into the material in the same amount of time, which is gonna be really useful for these thicker weaves. And if you want to create strong resin parts without the extra work of adding fibers, check out the engineering resins from today's sponsor, Soraya Tech. Choose blue for ultimate strength, the semi-flexible Tenacious for extra toughness, and fast for everything else, including everyday prints. Check them out at soraya.tech or at the links below. So let's check out what we have for materials for fillers, and I have no idea how well each of these is gonna work. Now, you might notice that this is a bright white reflective weave and not, you know, the typical black carbon fiber look. Now, I picked glass fiber because it usually offers the exact same strength as carbon fiber, but it allows light to pass through and we need light to cure our parts. So I think we have a better chance of success using these essentially clear but diffuse fibers instead of a opaque black carbon fiber. So these are all materials from a store that usually sells these for, you know, additives for boat building, etc. And that's where you see a lot of resin used. So we've got two different cloths. One is a very heavy and thick cloth and another one is a lot thinner. So if this heavy cloth turns out to be too much to expose through, then we can switch over to the thinner one. And as something that's maybe a bit more easily available compared to this cloth type material, we've got a drywall paper. Now this is uh, the German variant of drywall paper. This is actually glass fiber as well. And it looks kind of like a, a thin compressed felt material. It's still easy to tear, still rips, but this supposedly is glass fiber. So we're gonna try that out as well. This is the thinnest type of fabric that I have. Both of these are a lot thicker. So I think this has the best chance of actually succeeding. So with all of these different fillers, I'll be printing a filloween style bend test that's gonna have a layer of the, you know, reinforcement fiber material on the top and on the bottom. That should make for the strongest possible part using these additives. And then we're gonna see whether that part prints at all and how much stronger it is than the baseline. And that's what we're gonna be printing first, a non-fillered standard part using pretty much default settings on the Mars 2 Pro using the Elegoo standard uh, transparent or translucent resin. This is gonna allow us to get as much light into the part as possible, and it's gonna give us a great view of those added fibers. So here is my bucket of parts, and this actually all went way better than I was expecting. Um, every single part succeeded so far. These are still uncured. The only problem with the, um, with the coarse mesh, with this thicker type of cloth, is that yes, it is a bit of a mess, and I had to spend some time cleaning the printer up, but yeah, these I think are all turning out very, very nicely. The one challenge that I was running into is that on the Elegoo Mars 2 Pro, uh, when you change the layer time while the print is paused, 
that's not being saved. So that's immediately being overwritten. So what I would have to do instead of pausing the print, then adding that second layer of fiber and then resuming it, I would have to set the layer time first then pause it, add the fiber, and then it will print that bonding layer that would encase that second layer of fiber properly. Otherwise, I was just getting two empty layers basically, and then I got my properly cured one. Other than that, these were printed at pretty much stock settings, two second layers and five 60 second layers up top. So that was enough to encase the fiber on that very first set of layers. So what's left for all of these is to wash them and then cure them. But I thought of one more thing that I can try and that is regular old printer paper. This is recycled paper. Um, it's also a fibrous material. And if you think about, you know, what PCBs are made of, um, probably the world's most common composite material, um, it's either the high end ones are glass fiber and resin, but the lower end ones are just paper plus resin. So I'm thinking paper could also be a good contender. And the good thing about paper is, you know, everyone has a piece of paper near them. So you guys can try this out for yourselves. Um, cut it to size, plop it in the printer and give it some extra time to cure. Top layer is a lot drier and a lot less saturated, but the bottom layer is like totally in there. Look at this mess. So here's all the parts done. I just gave them a light sanding to clean up, you know, all the edges uh, where the fibers were still sticking out and where I got some rough edges from cutting off the fibers with a knife. And actually sanding off fibers works a lot better than taking a knife and trying to, to grind them off. Um, so these parts are very smooth. You know, on some of these, you can even barely see that there's any fiber in it. So if you take the one where I used the drywall paper or drywall glass fiber, this looks nearly identical to the one that doesn't have anything in it. So that is a really neat aesthetic. And even with the heavier cloth type material, you can see that the light refracts slightly differently and that there's a bit of glossiness in the surface, but really it's not that visible at all. And actually this was a lot easier to do and to create than I was thinking. Um, I mean, the material soaked really well in the fabric. The printer had no issues at all um, printing through this material. I gave it a 90 second cure layer when I added that second um, layer on the bottom of the part. Um, but other than that, I just used the well, default, the standard settings of 60 seconds uh, for the first five layers where it would impregnate that first layer of fabric and, you know, in a normal print, just bond to the bed. And that worked perfectly, even for the thicker, you know, what I call the heavy cloth material. One thing that I did notice on that first print where I had only one side of the drywall material in it because the second one didn't stick is that this part actually, maybe you can see it, actually curled and warped quite a bit during curing. And I think that's because, well, one side now has the reinforcement in it and the other side does not. So if you try this at home, you should always have both sides reinforced in the same way. Um, in fiber layup, you would call this a balanced layup where you have the same stack up on both sides. So let's go and break some parts.
So these test results are not what I expected or what I wanted to see, but when you think about them, they do make a lot of sense. Now, essentially every single pipe where we added fibers to them got weaker or a lot weaker compared to the you know non-reinforced resin only part. So when you have a part loaded under a bend load, you see the maximum forces on the outer edges of the part. So logically, you know, that's where you'd put your resin reinforcement because that can take more strain before it fails. However, the thing you also have to consider is that the fiber reinforcement is a lot more rigid than the base resin. So instead of taking just the same load that your resin only part would take, um, it now actually increases the load that's on the fibers because as the resin is, you know, still flexing away and, you know, not carrying at all and just deforming a bit, the fibers are already like pulling as hard as they can to keep themselves from failing. So you're kind of getting a runaway series of effects. First, the fibers see a lot of strain, um, they fail, they crack, and then you have just the resin itself taking the remainder of the load, which of course now is a thinner cross section, but it also already has, you know, starting cracks throughout that fiber reinforced layer. So yeah, in the end, that does not make for a stronger part. What we did see, however, is the parts do become more rigid. So for the same amount of force applied, they do not bend as much. But I don't just want to leave it at that and say, okay, we, we have more rigid parts, but parts that are actually weaker, that's not very satisfying. So I'm going to try two more things and hopefully make a part that is actually stronger and more rigid as well. Okay, so that's a lot better. The three layers of fiber per side, so six total layers part is up at 22.79 kilograms of load up from 14.05 kilograms for the stock untreated resin only part. So that is 50% more strength and probably even more in rigidity. And I think that is a really good improvement for just being a first set of experiments with, you know, just a few random materials that I tried out just trying to see if it works at all. The part with the like 23 layers of the drywall fiber did not do so well. It ended up at 10.99 kilograms, so weaker than just the resin part. So I think this drywall fiber stuff just is not suitable for reinforcing plastics like this. But this heavy cloth is definitely working well. Now, like I said, this is just a first set of experiments trying to see if this sort of approach works at all. And you know, this thin, long, testing part probably isn't the best example for trying to see how much the fiber improves things. Um, something that's a bit flatter or maybe even thinner probably would see more gains in strength and rigidity. Um, maybe something like a quadcopter frame or I don't know, you name it. The great thing also is that the fibers don't have to be at the extreme, you know, at the first and at the last layer of the print. If you have a part that, you know, has some sort of connection, some sort of a bridge and you want to reinforce that, you can just insert a layer of fiber in the middle of your print and just reinforce that one bit. You don't have to do the entire print, which might not always be optimal. 
And for all of these tests, I think it's just great to see how easily the resin takes up the glass fiber. All I did was to increase the layer time for the layers where I inserted the fibers, and that's it. I didn't need any special resin, I didn't need any special machine, I didn't need uh, handcrafted sliced files, which I think with the uh, Mars machines, because that's all the Shitu system, that might be a bit hard to do anyways. But yeah, you can just do this with controls through the printer's touchscreen and that's it. I'm really interested in seeing what you all make of this. If you have an application for this and put it to use and if you find uh, a different glass fiber mesh that works better or a coarser, thinner one, different stack ups, all that is still left out for experimentation. So if you try to do something like this, please leave a comment below and let me know what you came up with and what you found. Now, one note, if you decide to try this out for yourself, when working with fibers, do wear some safety equipment, wear a respirator, wear some gloves. And as you can see, I've changed my clothes like three or four times throughout this video because I always got like little glass fiber bits stuck in my sleeves and you know, those itch and just having glass fibers around you isn't particularly healthy. So be safe when you do try these things, especially once you go to sanding because that really creates some pretty nasty particles. Any big thank you goes out to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. Um, without your support, I couldn't be doing these open-ended experiments and just trying things out without knowing that they're gonna turn into a great YouTube video. Um, so thank you for your support. If you're not a supporter yet and are interested in becoming one, um, there's Patreon and there's YouTube memberships and I'd be really grateful if you check those out. So yeah, thank you for watching. Thanks for sticking through these uh, interesting experiments. And yeah, keep on making. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.